let's go ahead and get started. So writing emails that get read. This is a this is something that I came up with based on a faculty member. Um, she was looking for some resources about tone in emails, and and we were thinking, well. If, if you're looking for stuff for proofreading, there's stuff for that, but tone is just something you kind of have to be taught um, and you have to practice. So that's why I kind of came up with this webinar was for her and hopefully it's going to benefit you guys as well. So today we're going to learn how to write relevant subject lines for emails, how to craft clear and concise prose, how to adjust the tone of your message for your audience, and also how to proofread. And then we'll put a a couple other nuggets of wisdom in there that I've learned over the years. Uh, so a little bit about me first. So I have my PhD in English um, from the University of North Texas. And while I was at the University of North Texas, I also taught technical communication. So it was really uh, fun to put together this presentation because I got to integrate and use some of the things that I taught my students in technical writing at UNT. I was able to use it for this presentation um, and because it's pretty universal. So before we start, I want to start with some facts. So the average office worker receives 80 emails a day. I know for a lot of you, it feels like more, especially post, you know, uh, COVID stay at home orders, it can feel like double that. Um, and so we're having to sift through a lot of email messages in order to do our jobs. And it can be really, really frustrating. Another fact I'd like to point out is that 64% of working professionals have sent or received emails that unintentionally cause anger or resentment. And I definitely understand that. I've probably been one of those 64% of professionals. Um, and I think it also has to do with this, this information overload that we have that it can be really frustrating because we just want to get down to the nugget of, of what this person is trying to say. And so it could be really frustrating and you might count yourself among these statistics as well. So the first step in sending a good email is to ask yourself, do you really need to send an email? <laughs> so if you, if you need an immediate, you know, answer on something, there are other ways to do that. So we here at TCC, we use Microsoft Teams and it's a very versatile software. So if I need to just, you know, say I'm working on a committee that's doing an event and I need to make sure that there's not an event, a big event on that day, I can contact somebody in student development services really quickly via Teams and chat with him and get that information as opposed to an email. So in Teams, you can do virtual meetings, you can chat, and you can also call somebody and just ring them up um, during office hours. So these are all things that are really helpful and can avoid sending an email. You can also text. So I do have a couple people that I will text to just get, get some information. And you can also do a phone call. So I would say really think long and hard about whether you need to send an email in the first place. Once you've determined that, yes, this is something that you can't um, go ahead and, and get an answer for just via a text message or a call, um, we're going to start thinking about like how to craft an email that's going to get opened and is going to get responded to. So first you want to write a concise, relevant subject line. So they have found that subject lines with more than three words experience a drop in open rate by over 60%. Um, so when it comes to emails, like we want to get things really fast. We want that information to be provided and easy for us to get. So if you have more than three words in your subject line, uh, people lose interest and they're not, they're not necessarily motivated to open it. Uh, you also need to summarize your message and grab the reader's attention. So I have some examples here and take a moment to read these. And then in the chat, Go ahead and let me know what concise, relevant subject line would you use for these emails. So go ahead and take a moment and then type your response in the chat. And these are real emails that I've sent out and received. 
So we've got, for the first one, we've got IT survey update. That's really good. Survey progress from Carmen. I would say even saying it's IT, an IT survey uh, gives the reader a bit more information because they might have multiple surveys out. Um, IT service results, IT service query, and then we've got boot camp results for that second email. Um, boot camp assessment results for that that second email. Um, so these are all really valid responses, right? And I think you guys are pretty good at coming up with a concise, relevant subject line. So that's pretty much how you do it. Um, just concisely summarize your message in about three words or less. Okay, so the next step is the message itself. So you want to start off with a personalized salutation. Um, so that's going to be, we're going to talk about that more in tone, um, but people really like it when you start with a dear their name. It makes it personal, you know, as opposed to me sending out a form email um, without a salutation. So start with that salutation, kind of address them by their title. Um, when it comes to actually writing the email, uh, I go by the, the maxim of new idea, new paragraph, because you want to chunk out that information because there are some emails that I receive that are quite dense and it's hard to kind of drill down to see what the message is and what am I, what am I supposed to do? Because that's what an email is for. You're trying to get someone to do something or you're trying to convey information so somebody can do something with that information. Um, one way you can break up a dense email is to use bulleted or numbered list. Bulleted lists can be used just for lists of items or ideas that you want to talk about, uh, you would use a numbered list to do steps in order. So if there's a new process for funding or uh, a new process that has to be followed for, you know, keys or something like that in your department, you can use a numbered list. You know, you have to do steps one through three. Um, you want to be reader focused instead of writer focused. A lot of the emails that we send, it's usually something that we need. And so it's easy to forget that there's another person on the end of that email that's going to have to do something to give us that information. Um, whenever I was working at UNT, I was the editor of the undergraduate catalog. And I had this problem a lot where I would be emailing somebody and needing the information from them, but it was more me focused. I wasn't explaining to them why I needed the information or what they could do to, to get the information. Uh, for example, we had uh, one protocol where they had to fill out a form, but I wasn't giving them the place to go to get that form. I wasn't giving them the link. And so I learned, oh, okay, I need to think about this from a reader-focused perspective rather than a writer-focused perspective. And you also want to have a beginning, middle, and end. Okay, like any good story, an email needs to have a beginning, middle, and end. In that beginning, you want to make sure that you have what you want, your call to action essentially. In the middle, you want the details. And at the end, you kind of want to reiterate that call to action and uh, let them know that you're looking forward to a response. So let's look at, look at some good examples and bad examples of clear and concise prose. So take a moment uh, to read this. I know it's a lot. <laughs> and give me your impressions in the comment box, please. <laughs> Carmen says, whoa, that's long. I don't even want to read it. Yeah, Julia Frank says the it's too long. The writing is not concise. Uh, Sarah has lost focus already. Um, uh, and Fongo says it looks like the start of a bad <laughs> novel. And somebody said somebody else said I read a little, but I lost interest. And some people just skip to the end. Yeah, it's hard to get to the point. So there's a lot of stuff going on here, um, but I think the 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 writer is breaking kind of all the rules that we talked about. It's very 
writer focus. It's like, I'm currently a screenwriting major, my dilemma, I'm planning, I'm shooting. And it's like, if you get an email like this, it's obviously that this person wants something from the recipient of this email. Maybe they want some feedback on their script, or maybe they want some information of how to get an agent, but they're so focused on their needs that they're not really thinking about how is the reader going to know what to give you. And they're kind of getting lost in that. So this email, they're really, they're really kind of wrapped up in themselves and they're not thinking about what the reader needs to take action on the email. It's also incredibly dense. We've got some really, really, um, what I like to call mono paragraphs, you know, um, these paragraphs could probably be broken down into smaller two to three paragraph chunks. It could probably be broken up um, into bullets. Uh, Sarah says, yes, it, what exactly do you need? Because <laughs> so many of the emails that we get, they want something from us and we need to take an action. We need to do something and we just want to make, we want to make it happen and we want to get it off of our to-do list, right? Um, yes, you get students that send us faculty this way. Yes, uh, we do get emails from students and I have a couple of good ones. I have a really good student email later that I'll show you. Um, for my, uh, when I was teaching online, or actually it was from a class at UNT that I was teaching. So we kind of got the problems with this one. So let's look at another example and see if it fits what we talked about. So let's look at this example. So what's going on here? Go ahead and take a read and then go to town in the chat box. Okay, so we got some responses. So um, it's much, so James says it's much better. It's bullet focused. There are important items that are bolded. Uh, people like the numbered items. Uh, it is clear and concise. And if it's not prose, at least it is readable. Um, it's easy to read, much better, uh, clear and specific, breaks down choices, and is simple to understand. Lorena said she actually read the whole email. Fantastic, I'm so glad. Uh, so this is an email that I actually uh, sent to uh, faculty who were completing my Blackboard boot camp. And though I had 10 people who completed the, the boot camp uh, successfully, I had a couple of stragglers that were struggling with some of the assignments because um, there are four assignments you need to complete. And so I made this really reader focused. Like I was thinking about what information do they need to know in order to successfully complete the boot camp. So I was like, okay, they need to know the assignments, I'm gonna bold the assignment titles um, so that they can, if they're scanning, it'll just catch their eye, right? And they can know, okay, all right, I did the crappy syllabus, I did the lesson plan, I did the assessment, and then I gave them their two options. They could either work on their own time and finish before our next formal boot camp in July, or they could join me in real time in July to finish their assignments. Um, and John says it's friendly too, so that's something you also need to be thinking about because you can, be giving the reader all the information they need, but if your tone comes off as stringent or unfriendly or stern or just angry, um, people can shut down and they won't want to complete it. So I could have written this in a completely different tone um, and it could have had people really shut down. Um, and so I was really focused on having this tone be open, um, encouraging, and letting people know what their options were. So that's how you kind of craft clear and concise prose. And it's just a continual practice. Like you're gonna get better and better. Um, and just remember to keep that reader in mind. Think about 
how you would like to receive this information. Um, would you like to receive this information in a friendly, clear, concise way? Or do you, are you gonna receive it badly in a different way? So just kind of keep that in mind as you're writing these emails. So this brings us to tone, which I think is really important. Uh, you wanna match the level of formality to the person who's receiving the email. So with my boss, um, his name is Tom Mills. Um, I always address him as Tom or Dr. Mills. I'm never gonna address an email to him like, hey, Tommy, how are you doing? I need this information, you know, because that's disrespectful. He's my boss, I'm not gonna do that. Um, even, even though you wanna watch your level of formality, write conversationally, write the, the way that you talk. Um, and I think that's really gonna make you um, more comfortable writing emails because you find your voice, right? Um, once again, you wanna put yourself in the reader's shoes and you wanna pause before you hit send. <laughs> this is really important. Um, it's like the, the, the good piece of advice where it's like you never wanna write an email when you're angry. You wanna kind of step back and, uh, and really think before you hit reply. So we're gonna look at a couple of examples of tone in emails, and I'm gonna put up this email that I received from a student. Um, I'll give you some details. So this student was, um, I found that they had plagiarized a portion of their paper, and I let them know that they had plagiarized and would be receiving a zero on their assignment for the semester, and this was the email that I got back. So go ahead and read it, and then give me your reactions in the chat. So we got a couple of responses, so I'll address those as you kind of are, are, are uh, finishing up reading this. So uh, James says, just as missed you, yikes. Uh, Julia says, the student sounds frustrated, and I think they definitely were. Uh, Sandy asked, did the student drop the class? Should, they did not, they failed the assignment, and I think that resulted in them failing the course. Um, and then Brenna Sanders, you said it was difficult to read. Why was it difficult to read for you? So like, just drop in the chat, uh, give me a bit more specific. Um, and then Carmen said, I think the student must have hit send before thinking it out. So David confirms poor grammar, frustrated, frustrated. Sarah says hard to read. Sarah, yeah, let me know why it was hard to read. Um, and it seems the student was having a hard time putting the problems on me rather than themselves. Okay, so Brenda says that it's the spelling and grammar. Um, I do prefer to the point. So I think what's what's the major issue here is that when I received this email, I didn't have a problem with the grammar and punctuation. It was just the tone that was, that was, it was incredibly frustrating. Um, and it kind of, it was dismissive of me and the help that I had tried to provide. Um, the student didn't want to acknowledge that they plagiarized. And I think um, us as teachers were much more likely to help students if they admit that they did make a mistake 
And uh, yeah, somebody said, Brenna said, maybe the student should have waited to hit the send button. Um, I feel like I tried my best to let this student know that there were options for them. Like they could have met with me to discuss their plagiarized uh, paper and that they could have a chance to redo it. Um, but they clearly were beyond that, essentially. Um, yeah, write it, but come back later and read it again. Yeah, Sarah, the, the, the fact that the student didn't take responsibility was, was an issue for me as an instructor. Um, but I think the tone here, this is not reader friendly. You know, if the student was wanting something from me here, it's not really clear what the purpose of the email was. Um, or if it's, as somebody else said before, to just kind of deflect blame onto me um, as, opposed to, as opposed to taking responsibility for their actions. So this is an example of an email where, you know, grammar, spelling, and punctuation isn't necessarily the issue, it's the overall tone of the email. So I'm going to share with you some other um, emails that I got from students in my classes. So go ahead and read these and then discuss what you think about the tone in the chat. Oh yeah, Julia said the students seem to be venting and shouldn't have sent that to the professor. I definitely agree. <laughs> so yeah, go ahead and read these emails and then tell me what you think in the chat. Oh, Myra says, Did you do you offer this for students? I feel they need this session. Not at this time, I'm mostly teaching faculty. But you can, I'll be sending you the link to this, so you can definitely share this with your students. Okay, I'll go over some of the responses. So um, these have a much more positive tone. Yeah, much easier to respond back. So especially in the first one, uh, the student does have a problem, does have an issue, uh, but they're very respectful. You know, they start off with good afternoon. Ooh, that is so nice. You know, like they're actually taking that time to do that salutation. Um, they noticed that they had an F and that no comments were left to tell you what they did wrong. And then they also said that they saw a little blue circle that says in progress. So they're taking time to describe the problem and uh, let ask like, what does this mean? Like, I don't think I got this grade. Like, they obviously think that they got the grade um, in error, uh, but instead of being frustrated, being angry and venting, um, they're like, hey, can you explain uh, <laughs> what this means? Because I don't think this is what I got. And it turns out what happened is um, Blackboard um, had shown, for some reason it didn't show up that they were in progress for the assignment, so I accidentally gave them a zero. So you're right, it does have a much more positive tone. They're taking responsibility for, for their learning and it's cordial. Uh, Sarah says, the second email made me laugh and made me feel good. Um, I really like this because it has this gif of uh, Meryl Streep and it, it was cool because throughout the semester in my announcements, I had been using gifs and so my students figured out how to do it in their emails. And so it was really nice to get this kind of clapping send off for the end of the semester. Um, so yeah, respectful tone, they're doing a lot better, right? And also the purpose of the message is very clear. Like I wanna go ahead and rectify what I see as a problem, but they're doing it in a respectful way. And as a result, I'm much more likely to help this student than I was with the student who gave me guff in the previous email. 
So proofreading. So proofreading is really important because you want to check for grammar, spelling, and punctuation mistakes before you hit send. If your email is going to be going campus-wide or department-wide, if it's going to have a much bigger audience, you want to make sure that you have somebody else read it before it goes off, out. And this is uh, the case with me. Like I'll draft emails that get sent out to the entire campus, and that has to go through a chain of command before it actually somebody hits send on it. Uh, I like to use tools like Grammarly, so I'm going to show you what that looks like. So if you use Grammarly here, uh, hopefully everybody, can everybody see my screen? Yes? Okay. Crystal says Grammarly is great. So I can say, you know, dear uh, supervisor, that was a great idea. And if you're using Grammarly, um, it will let you know like, hey, this is a problem. Um, so it'll say the word great doesn't seem to fit in this context, consider replacing it with a different word. Um, and if you have Grammarly Premium, it'll go above and beyond that and actually help you uncover kind of structural problems in the way you write. I love Grammarly. Everybody's like, yes, 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 Grammarly. It's really helpful because I think so much of what we do is writing every day, uh, especially um, with the emails that we send and all the documents that we do in community college life, um, it, is, it is quite a lot of typing. So Grammarly really does save me and help me out. And I have a PhD in English. Um, I shouldn't need Grammarly, but it, it's, re it's a really helpful tool. We can't be perfect all the time. So that's how you would use Grammarly. Um, also, you can do something like a signature block. I love doing these for, because I wear a lot of hats. So I, and the coordinator for academic support services at TR, but I also work as an adjunct for Connect. So I have separate email signatures for different emails um, based on who my audience is. And there are websites like HubSpot.com where you can go and generate your email signature based on a template that they have. And that's just kind of a little bit of a nice touch at the end of your email. So that's pretty much all I have for the end of this. Um, I invite you to send me an email. So you can send me an email at my email that's there and uh, ask me for information for a project you are working on. You may invent the necessary details, um, tell me a good story, and your email must have the following, uh, or please follow the following guidelines. Use the subject line seeking information, because um, I'm gonna be using a, a filter to get all of those in one folder instead of having my inbox blow up. Uh, have an appropriate salutation. Use an introductory sentence that gets right to the point. Uh, body text that explains details, and then a conclusion that invites further action and have your signature block with your name. So congratulations, you completed this webinar. I hope you had a really good time and uh, reward yourself with something nice. And I hope you have a really good day. Uh, like I said, I'll be uh, posting a video of this later today and sending you the link shortly. So, oh, can you put the last slide up? Yes, I can, Jeff. So yeah, if you want to, you can send me an email uh, using all that you just learned. And yeah, you're welcome, everybody. Um, and you can always contact me at Jeanette.Laredo at tccd.edu. And that'll be it. So I'll just wait until everybody goes until I close the session.